Hi, welcome to this showcase of Integrating Computer Science and Movement in Education. I'm Ben Wheeler. So first, a little bit about me. I've been Senior Product Engineer at Scratch, a Curriculum Developer and PD Designer for New York City's CS4ALL program. I started this after-school program in Brooklyn, New York, doing creative technology with kids. And I've been an advisor to a bunch of different schools and ed tech companies. I also, most important of all, have been an enthusiastic dancer since 1989. Here's me with my niece. So why this showcase workshop and why did I say since 1989, these are connected. 1989 was when I first experienced movement in a joyful way. I had not grown up a dancer. I didn't know how to move my body in ways that felt prideful and powerful. And in fifth grade, college students in this program called City Step came to my public school and started working with my whole class to do modern dance with us. And it was life-changing for me. I felt like it was reawakening a language that I hadn't known since I was much younger, since I was a little kid. There's this concept of embodied imagination. You can use what your body knows to imagine, to create, to dream. That kind of imagination can feel like it's imposing. It can be discouraged. It can be unwelcome. But it can also be something that's supported and where a school environment is a place where you're invited to bring your whole physical self into the room. That's what was so life-changing for me. And there's a question that I've been kind of grappling with in one form or another ever since. Uh, what does my body know versus what does my mind know alone? One form that this took early on, which connects movement to technology so much for me, is I started learning the logo programming language. This was the late 80s, and moving this turtle forward and right and repeating a bunch of times, making stars and different kinds of circles, I found myself imagining sort of being the turtle when I needed to debug what was going wrong and stepping through the steps to see, oh, I'm turning left, but I want to turn right. This is a concept that Seymour Papert, one of the creators of Logo, found came up again and again with young people using Logo. They called it playing turtle. And he thought this is something core to programming. It's not just about Logo. It's about a whole way of using your physical imagination to debug and to put yourself in the computer's shoes. So there's this concept of embodied knowledge. This has been articulated and described by a bunch of people before. The question for us to hold on to in this workshop is what unique understandings can embodied knowledge build if we can build it up with children? I think of us as embarking at the beginning of an exploration of this productive overlap between computer science and movement. And I'm wondering who's doing this work? What can we learn from them? How can this practice be done successfully in classrooms? And what does it look like when we're able to do it well? So in this showcase workshop, I'm really trying to bring us together in conversation. I want to learn more than I have to tell anyone else. So I'm hoping we can break out, we can share ideas, reflections, proposals, exchange questions, and start a conversation that we can carry forward together. So there are questions that I want to articulate to guide this exploration. First and foremost, safety. Whenever we're talking about trying something radically new that might upend expectations that children have in the classroom, we want to be talking about how this is going to be done, anticipating issues that might come up. And particularly when we're talking about physical movement, exploring bodies, there are all sorts of kinds of trauma, pain, and complexities. So we want to position safety not as an afterthought of, let's do this whole thing, by the way, do it safely. But we want to try to bake safety into the beginning to build conversations and build language with students to establish consent as a core element, not an afterthought. I also want to name access and adaptation as questions that are important for us to keep close. Some scholars have articulated this tricky and dangerous idea of default bodies and a contrasting idea of access needs. This is something that I've heard articulated in the disability justice movement. This idea that it's not merely that a small number of us 
who have specific diagnosed disabilities have access needs. We all have needs that allow us to access education and opportunity. Those can be as simple as having a meal in your stomach, having energy, not being sleepy. They can also be an issue of chronic pain or of eyesight, of distractions, the need to take breaks or language translation. And then there are all sorts of accommodations that are specific to a diagnosed disability. But it's helpful to encourage students to be aware of these things and to be ready to name them wherever on that spectrum they fall and to treat this as a universal category of experience. In this kind of work, I also want to name that it matters how rigorous the educational experience is. It's easy to say, now we're going to run around and have a good time and smile, and that's a wonderful thing. And if that's all you do every day, maybe you're not learning enough specifically about movement and enough specifically about computer science. So it's helpful to name some of the elements that I think this type of approach can support. Breadth of understanding of what movement can involve, opportunities for pride in movement that students might not have had before. That was something I experienced so much as a student. And then in terms of students really learning about computer science, there's been a rich debate about these questions, not specifically as pertains to movement, but what does it mean for us to start exploring computer science concepts and computational thinking with very everyday, physically ready, familiar contexts? Do we always need to be using computers. And one element that Peter Denning has named is this idea that you must be dealing with computational models, not merely these non-computational abstractions. I think it's important to name some specific pieces of computer science thinking that programmers use. I've been a programmer for many years, and one of the core elements that I use every day in my work is looking for examples that break our expectations and finding where specific instructions fall short of matching what we actually want to be done by a computer. I think there's a lot here that can be that can be explored meaningfully and deeply without necessarily being computer based. There are also practical questions. How long this work might take? Is this just a few sessions of, uh, of fun? Or is this something that's worthy of a full unit? I've designed a curriculum unit that's approximately 18 hours. I'm wondering, is there space for something like that? And in which grades? And then also, how is this different in lower elementary, upper elementary, middle school, and high school? One practice I find hugely useful in deepening the conversation in a new topic or an existing topic is to take a single word or a set of ideas and to start to place different examples along different dimensions. So there's many different dimensions that I and some other graduate students I worked with identified in movement. For example, is the movement choreographed or improvised? Is the movement subject specific, oriented externally, or is it personal? involving expression of our feelings. Are we doing it solo or in a group? Are we representing concrete ideas in a literal way? Or are we moving in ways that are more abstract? These are only some of the dimensions we could define, and we should define more. I also want to name cultural responsiveness. When many of us hear culture, we think of dance. And when we hear dance, we think of culture. But it's important for us to remember that just because a particular student is of a particular culture that may include traditions of dance, that student doesn't necessarily know those traditions, practice those traditions, find those traditions relevant to them. Let's make sure that we're starting with a focus on the students themselves, their interests, their knowledge, and making our educational work genuinely responsive to what these young people identify with. So what's out there? What are people already doing? I wanted to describe a few categories and look at what people are exploring in each. So in algorithmic movement, which is my name for defining sequences that describe movement, acting the movement out, seeing a movement, 
and translating that into codified sequences and moving back and forth. There's a few examples that come to mind. One is this wonderful program in New York City called STEM from Dance. Another is that Harvard's creative computing curriculum, which is focused on scratch, but also broader computational thinking concepts, has this wonderful activity called Programmed to Dance with a set of videos involving Karen Brennan and Mitch Resnick doing dance movements and prompting students to come up with their own descriptions and their own way of writing these algorithms. Programmable sensors and hardware, these are categories of generally small scale hardware devices that are designed to take input and give some form of output that can be used in artistic craft projects, but also used in movement. So Makey Makey is well known. You can use it in all sorts of ways, but there are some uses of Makey Makey that specifically support movement. This stem in the gym activity, for example. Microbit is amazing for making kinetic art or other kinds of sculptural algorithmic creations. And Unruly Splats is this wonderful invention where you can use a block-based programming language to code up what should happen when each of these interactive light-up mats is pressed. You can create games and activities. Crafting and art is something that we don't necessarily start by thinking in a movement context, but it can often be used in conjunction with performance, making elements that can be shown off physically or that can be used in stage presentations. I've seen this to great effect in some Brooklyn public schools. Connecting to this idea of performance, there are professional performers who use technology. One is Miral Kotab, whose program Illuminate involves all sorts of LED wiring, using that together with dance in this stunning way. And then I've had some wonderful times with students taking a single coin cell battery and a single LED, that's all you need to light it up, giving one to everybody, having them figure out how to make it light, then turning the lights out and waving them all around to make these 3D sculptures in the air. There are also ready to use experiences, apps and devices that are pretty much ready to go as tools for movement. One that I love is this app called Boundin, where two people hold the same phone and the app shows them a landscape that they have to navigate by turning the phone in all sorts of different ways. And then last, in the spirit of going where the kids are and paving the cow paths, so to speak, it's worth noting that there are these viral dances online that kids are already into without any teacher having to tell them to be. There are also viral memes like the Flappy Bird push-up challenge, where you can use a scratch face sensing extension to control a bird with your nose and then move it up and down by doing push-ups. To my surprise, kids have come to me out of the blue and asked me to help them do this. There's a tremendous amount that you can do with Scratch specifically and movement. I have a Scratch studio here. I encourage you to check it out where I have a wide variety of different projects that involve or suggest movement in different ways. The Scratch video sensing extension lets you make interactive games where you can pop balloons, move a soccer ball. You can use Microbit to perform music and do other sorts of performance including sound sensing. And then this new Scratch Lab extension called Video Sprites that I worked on lets you put live video of you inside a sprite or many sprites. I love this example of a kaleidoscope here. So last, I have this curriculum unit that I developed a few years ago. I've done elements of it in different classrooms, but I'm eager for feedback and I'd love to know what people think. There's a variety of different sessions. I wanted to focus on three quickly. One is an activity that I've done with kids before. Here's me with a room full of kids acting like a robot. The idea is that first the teacher and then the kids become a robot and follow these simple instructions. Step forward, turn left, turn right. It works great if you have a checkerboard linoleum floor. And I find it really effective at getting kids talking about the difference between the intention of an algorithm and the execution of it particularly if the robot is facing you and you say to turn left, which way does that robot turn? Dance Functions takes this program to dance activity from the creative computing curriculum and keeps going with it. 
So the idea is that students write pseudocode programs consisting of sequences of dance moves and name them. And then they can call their own programs by calling their names or other people's programs. And where the chaos really starts to be fun is when people are referring to each other's programs left and right. And then you have to run around the classroom and look at someone else's program to figure out which part comes next. Some of these never finish. Other ones allow for concepts like recursion to be spontaneously discovered. It can be a lot of fun. Projector performance comes out of something that I saw at a Scratch conference in the past by a mostly Japanese group, where you make a Scratch project that you project where some animation happens and you stand in front of it seeming to interact with the animation. So here's a teacher seeming to hold a watering can and pouring water onto a flower. And then to the left, you can see some teachers throwing fish food into a fish to eat who then gets attacked by a shark. So let's continue this conversation. Here are two QR codes, one for these slides on the left and the other one for an email list. I would love people's emails. Send me emails and I'll email everybody who does together so that we can have each other's emails. Let's continue this conversation and maybe build this community even bigger. Thanks so much.